I just want to respond to a point you made earlier, which was that people express their rejection of the partition resolution um, on the grounds that it gave the majority of the of Palestine to the Jewish community, which formed only a third. Um, whereas, in fact, uh, if I understood you correctly, you're saying the Palestinians and the Arabs would have rejected any partition resolution. Yeah, I, I think a couple I th- things. That one, they would have rejected any. Two, a lot of that land given was in the Negev. It was pretty terrible land at the time. And well, then three, the land that would have been partitioned to Jews, I think, would have been. Um, I think I saw it was like five hundred thousand Arab. Uh, it would have been five hundred thousand Jews, four hundred thousand Arabs, and I think like eighty thousand Bedouin would have been there. So the the state well, would have been divided. I, I, th- close I to think them. you raise a valid point um, because I think the Palestinians did reject the partition of their homeland in principle, and I think the fact that um, the United Nations General Assembly then awarded the majority of their homeland. Um, uh, to the Zionist movement only added insult to injury. I mean, um, uh, one doesn't have to sympathize with the Palestinians um, to recognize that they have now been a stateless people for 75 years. Can you name any country, yours for example, or yours, that would be prepared to give 55%, 25%, 10%, of your country to the Palestinians? Of course not. And so um, the issue was not the existence of Jews in Palestine. Um, They had been there for centuries. And of course they had ties to Palestine and particularly to Jerusalem and and other places going back centuries, if not millennia. Um, But the idea of establishing an exclusively Jewish state at the expense of those who are already living there. I think it was right to reject that. And I don't think we can look back now, 75 years later, and say, well, you should have accepted losing 55% of your homeland because you ended up losing 78% of it, and the, addition, and the remaining 22% was occupied in 1967. That's, that's not how things work. Yeah. Um, I, and I, I, can, I, can imagine, mm-hmm. I can imagine an American rejecting giving 10% of the United States to the Palestinians. And if that rejection leads to war and you lose half your country, I doubt that 50 years from now you're going to say, well, maybe I should have accepted that. Sure. So I like this answer more than what I usually feel like I'm hearing when it comes to the Palestinian rejection of the 47 partition plan. Because sometimes I feel like a weird switch happens to where the Arabs in the area are actually presented as entirely pragmatic people who are simply doing a calculation and saying like, well, we're losing 55% of our land, Jews are only maybe one third of the people here, and we've got 45, and nah, the math doesn't work basically. But it wasn't a math problem, I think, like you it said. It was a matter of principle. It was an ideology problem. No, it was a matter of principle. Yeah, ideologically mm-hmm. driven, that that they, as a as a people, have a right to or are entitled to this land that they've never actually had an independent state on, that they've never had even a guarantee of an independent state on, that they've never actually ruled a government That, that last point is actually not correct, because <laughs> for all its injustice, um, the mandate system recognized Palestine as a class A mandate, which provisionally recognized the independence of, of that territory. Of what would emerge from that territory, but of not that of the ter- Palestinians. It was provisionally mm-hmm. recognized. But not, but the, the territory itself was, but not of the Palestinian people to have a right or well, a guarantee to a government well, that would emerge from It was a British it. mandate of Palestine, not the British mandate of Israel. <clears throat> The word exclusive, which you keep using, is nonsense. The state which Ben-Gurion envisioned would be a Jewish majority state as they accepted the 1947 partition uh, uh, resolution, as Stephen said, uh, that included 400,000 plus Arabs in a state which would have 500,000 Jews. So the idea of exclusivity wasn't anywhere in the air at all among the Zionist leaders in 47, 48. They wanted a Jewish majority state, but were willing to accept a state which had 40% Arabs. That's one point. The second thing is 
the Palestinians may have regarded the land of Palestine as their homeland, but so did the Jews. It was the homeland of the Jews as well. The problem was the Arabs were unable and remain to this day unable to recognize that for the Jews, that is their homeland as well. And the problem then is how do you share this homeland, either with one binational state or separate this partitioned into two states? The problem is that the Arabs have always rejected both of these ideas. The awesome. homeland belongs to the Jews, as Jews feel, as much as it does, I think, if not I would more, say than for the Arabs. Jews. I would say for the Jews. It's the Jewish people's I would also, homeland. Real quick, I just want for both of you guys, because I haven't heard these questions answered. I really want these questions to be, I'm just so curious how to make sense of them. Um, it was correctly brought up that I believe that Ben-Gurion had, um, I think Shlomo uh, ben Amid describes it as an obsession with getting validation or support from Western states. Um, Great Britain, and then a couple decades later, that it becomes- explains the, the Suez uh, War, the Suez yeah, Crisis. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, correct. That was one of the major motivators, the idea to work with Britain and France on a military operation An imperial against Arabs. Stooge. But then the question, again, I go back to, if that is true, if Ben-Gurion, if the early uh, Israel saw themselves as a Western fashion nation, how could we possibly imagine that they would have engaged in the transfer of some 400,000 Arabs after accepting the partition plan? Would that not have completely and totally destroyed their legitimacy in the eyes of the entire Western world? Would no. there not have been? How not? Well, first of all, I think that that the Zionist leadership's acceptance of um, the partition resolution, um, and, and I think you may have written about this, that they accepted it because it provided international endorsement of the, the legitimacy of the principle of Jewish statehood, and they didn't accept the borders. Um, and in fact, uh, later expanded the borders. Second of all, no, the, the borders, the borders were expanded the borders. in war. They ex accepted the UN partition resolution, borders and all. They, they That's accepted, how they accepted, they accepted it. You can say that some of the Zionists, deep in their hearts, had the, the idea that maybe well, at some point including they would most, be able to get yeah, more. Including but, but their most senior leaders who said yes, so, and I think you've quoted them as saying so. But they grudgingly accepted what the United the, Nations, yes. the world community, yes. had said, this is what you're yes. going to get. And, and second of all, I mean, removing dark people, darker dark. people, it's, it, it's, dark. it's intrinsic, in it's in Israel, intrinsic, as dark as it's, Arabs. it's intrinsic to Western history. So mm -hmm. the idea that Americans or Brits or the French would have an issue with, I mean, the French had been doing it in Algeria for decades. The Americans have been doing it in North America for centuries. So how would Israel forcibly displacing um, Palestinians somehow besmirch um, uh, Israel in the eyes in fact, of the West. In, in the 1944 resolution of the Labor Party, and at the time, even Bertrand Russell was a member of the Labor Party, it endorsed transfer of Arabs out of Palestine. As Muin's pointed out, that was a deeply entrenched idea in Western thinking that there was nothing uh, it doesn't in any way contradict or violate or breach any moral values to displace uh, the Palestinian population. Now, I do believe there's a legitimate question. Had it been the case, as you said, Professor Morris, that the Zionists wanted to create a happy state with a Jewish majority, but a large Jewish minority, and if by virtue of immigration, like in our own country, in our own country, given the current trajectories, non-whites will become the majority population in our the United States quite soon. And according to democratic principles, we have to accept that. So if that were the case, I would say maybe there's an argument that had there been mass Jewish immigration change the demographic balance in Palestine, and therefore uh, Jews became the majority. You can make an argument in the abstract that the indigenous Arab population should have been accepting of that, just as whites in the United States, quote unquote whites, have to be accepting of the fact that the demographic majority is shifting to non-whites in our own country. But that's not what Zionism was about. I did write my doctoral dissertation on Zionism. And I don't want to get now bogged down in abstract ideas. But as I suspect you know, most theorists of nationalism say there are two kinds of nationalism. One is a nationalism based on citizenship. You become a citizen, 
you're integral to the country. That's sometimes called political nationalism. And then there's another kind of nationalism. And that says the state should not belong to its citizens. It should belong to an ethnic group. Each ethnic group should have its own state. It's usually called the German romantic idea of nationalism. Zionism is squarely in the Jew German romantic idea. That was the whole point of Zionism. We don't want to be Bundists and be one more ethnic minority in Russia. We don't want to become citizens and just become a Jewish people in England or France. We want our own state. Like the, like the Arab 23 states. No, wait, let's, before we yeah. get to the Arabs, let's, get, let's stick to the Jews for a moment or the Zionists. We want our own state. And in that concept, of wanting your own state, the minority at best lives on sufferance and at worst gets expelled. That's the logic of the German romantic Zionist idea of a state. That's why they're Zionists. Now, I personally, have shied away from using the word Zionism ever since I finished my doctoral dissertation. Because that's painful. <laughs> because as I said, I don't believe it's the operative ideology today. It's like talking about Bolshevism and referring to Khrushchev. I doubt Khrushchev could have spelled Bolshevik. But for the period we're talking about, they were Zionists. They were committed to their exclusive state with, with a minority living on sufferance or at worst expelled. That was their ideology. And I really feel there's a problem with your happy vision of these Western Democrats like Weizmann and they wanted to live peacefully with the Arabs Weizmann described the expulsion in 1948 as, quote, the miraculous clearing of the land. That doesn't sound like somebody shedding too many tears at the loss of the indigenous population. Let me just you, respond you, to the word no, on sufferance. The, the okay. unsufferance I don't agree with. I think that's wrong. Mm -hmm. The Jewish state came into being in 1948. It had a population which was 20% Arab when it came into being after mm -hmm. Arab refugees, uh, many of them had become refugees, but 20% remained in the country. 20% of Israel's population at inception in 1949 was Arab. 80% went missing. No, 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 no. I was talking about what remained in Palestine, Israel, after it was created. Um, the 20% who lived in Israel received citizenship and all the rights of Israelis, except, of course, the right to serve in the army, which they didn't want to. Um, and uh, they have Supreme Court justices. They have Knesset members. They enjoy they basically lived under emergency basically, laws they, until 1966 for a, for a period. Sure, they yeah. lived under emergency. So they didn't immediately no, no, have no, no. citizenship. At, no, no, wait a second. At the beginning, fantasy. at the beginning, it's not fantasy. At the beginning, they received citizenship, mm -hmm. could vote in elections for their own people, and they were uh, put into parliament. Um, but uh, in the first years, the Israeli, uh, the, the Jewish majority, suspected that maybe the Arabs would be disloyal because they had just tried to destroy the Jewish state. Then they dropped the military government, and they became fully equal citizens. Um, so if the whole idea was they must have a state without Arabs, uh, they, this didn't happen in 49, then why, and it didn't happen in the then, in then sub, why, then why did decades. you say, Professor Morris, yes. then why did you say without a population expulsion, a Jewish state would not have been established. Because the, 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 you're missing the first section of that paragraph, mm -hmm. which was they were was being assaulted by the Arabs. And as a result, a Jewish state could not have come into being unless there had also been an expulsion of the population which was trying to kill them. Norm, I, I'm officially forbidding you referencing that again. <laughs> I, I think- Hold on a second, wait. Uh, we responded to it. So the, the main point you're making, we have to take Benny at his word is like, 
there was uh, a war, and that's the reason why he made that statement. 